checking things, making sure I'm actually live. Got to wait for the delay, if you will. Come on. All right, I got to hit refresh. There we go. Now it's going. Okay. All right. So, for those of you who are not going to be watching live, are coming after the fact, we are doing a 5.3 engine build, and this is actually a stroker motor now. It uh, had the three point, what is the factory? Three point, oh, I'm having a brain fart. I can't remember. 3.68? No, 3.78 is the bore. Regardless, it was a factory 5.3 crank. I went to a four inch stroke now, and I had to get different connecting rods. These have to be six and an eighth, six, one, two, five rods. And then of course, I had to get aftermarket pistons as well to go with it. Now, this engine, this particular engine is a very high mile engine and we're going to come up here close to look at the cylinder walls for you but it's amazing how well this thing wore out considering how nasty it was in the teardown of course later on I'll throw a link somewhere in the corner at some point for the teardown or maybe I'll throw a link in the description below but I did a live teardown of this engine as well this was one that had an oil pressure issue now that's important in this video because we're going to talk a little bit about oil pumps as well as clearancing things and cylinder walls, all that fun stuff like that. So, let's go ahead and move this guy out of the way. I only left one piston out. I did install all the rest of them. I left one out so I can show you the process of doing that while I am live. And we are going to kind of cover a couple things there, uh, checking bearing clearance a couple different ways. And then we're going to dive into this oil pump situation here. I did not replace the stock oil pump, even with oil pressure issues. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So, let's bring you closer here. Disconnect you from the wall. Hopefully I don't jar the camera too bad. That tends to happen when I'm live, of course. So I'm not sure how well this camera can see this. I wonder if I can zoom in while I'm on camera here. Just kind of, oh, there we go. Oh, kind of. Okay, so for some reason, this looks less worn or, or, or more worn or tattered or whatever than this one. But these cylinder walls, I really did nothing with them. Uh, you can see a very faint line right there. That line is actually the ridge ream if if you would even call it that it doesn't really have one you can see it more distinctly on this cylinder here um maybe the reflection of the piston is what's making oh there we go ah that's what's hiding it that's kind of cool so you can see the the so-called ridge ream there so we'll just go ahead and focus on this cylinder then there we go okay so you can see where the rings were coming up to the top and going down to the bottom now i checked the bore on this thing and it is out of round less than a thou i mean it's like a half a thou at best on any of the cylinders and then this this ridge that's here you can't feel it at all you can't even measure it you can just visually see it it's more polished right where the ring was coming up to and then of course down at the bottom where the ring stops it also polished the cylinder wall a little bit i did take my hone and run it through here very very lightly i used a 420 grit hone so an extremely fine hone and I just went in and out of this thing maybe nine times nine to twelve times at most just enough to get a real light scratching on it and I'm gonna leave it like that now there's a common myth that the rings need to break in well in today's engines and and or today's technology I should say new rings are cut so well that they have very little break in if any at all it's uh, rather impressive. Oh, geez, I gotta zoom out. Come on. Why is it not zooming out now? There we go. That's why I'm having trouble getting the right zoom. Live issues, fun live issues. There we go, plug you back in. So piston rings actually are typically laser cut now or, or EDM cut or something of that nature where they have a really, really precise circular formation to them and because of that they really require almost no break in time whatsoever i mean you might get a little bit of blow by at first but even with shiny walls like this you won't go past 10,000 miles and it'll be broken in even with a glazed wall 
So rings are really nice now unless you buy a cheap set of rings. So this is kind of a budget build for me. I typically am building it for somebody else and it's typically a situation of they want to make a lot of power. This one here is just, I want more stroke because I want more torque. So I'm putting a torque cam in here. I'll go ahead and show you the torque cam card here for any of you cam gurus. There it is. So, oh wait, that's not it. That's the wrong one. Where did I put it? This is the Extreme Torquinator. It's a Summon Pro, Summit, eh, Summit Pro LS Torque Cam. There we go, found it. So we'll go ahead and flash this up here and you can obviously pause it or whatever if you want. But uh, you can see this thing has, well, it's hard to do through the camera. Where are we looking? There it is. We have 600 lift, 585 lift. So we have a lot of lift in this cam, considering the the uh, timing specs. There we go. That's advertised duration, 261, 267. So it's not like it's a 280 cam or anything ridiculous. Um, it's got a 110 lobe separation, so it's going to be a bit choppy at idle. And then we got 212, 218 on intake and exhaust. So it's a little bit of split there, but it's a... Uh, a pretty mild cam. It's nothing crazy. It's not like it's a 234 or something like that intake and exhaust. So it's it's a rather mild, mildly aggressive cam. And I'm hoping that that camshaft is going to work really well with the stroke because of the cylinder heads I'm choosing alongside of it. I'm choosing a very small chamber cylinder head. I'm using the 706 heads, I believe. Yeah, 706. I have three sets of heads here. I have the 706. The eight, hang on, I'll go check. Eight, yeah, what is the number? 862s. And the 243s. I have all three heads here right now. And the 862s and 706 heads are pretty much identical. There's a little bit difference in the, the casting process. So the 862s are a rougher casting, the 706s are a smoother casting. The 706s, if they're, what's the company name? Um, well, they got a little battery emblem. You see a battery emblem on the head? It's a head that's prone to failure. This one does have that issue. I'm gonna use the battery heads in case I need to sell somebody a set of heads. I'll give them the 862s. I can always find another set of heads later. It's not a big deal, but I always wanna have a set on hand. Otherwise, if I don't sell a set of heads to somebody because of their vehicle being in a rush, I'm gonna go ahead and rebuild those and those will eventually end up on here too. I also did some cylinder head work to those cylinder heads and we'll talk about that a little later too. But I'm concentrated on low speed airflow with this engine and I want the stroke because it's gonna help draw that air in longer. And I think that camshaft is gonna give me a very good advantage for getting that low speed airflow picked up and rammed in there at the last second before that valve closes. So let's go ahead and start working on getting this piston in and get some measurements on the rod bearing. There's a couple ways you can go about it. One, of course, you can measure the, the bearing inside here after you put the bearing in, you, you tighten the cap down, you measure the bearing, you measure the crank. That has been done. I should have about one and a half to two thousandths clearance. Um, I'm going to just grab this bearing here. That was based off of the bearings I was checking. I did not check this specific bearing in this specific rod. But we are going to, on camera, not separately. We're going to do it in the engine itself. How many do we got? got a couple, couple live washers. Good. Alright, now I need a rag. I got a new toy, by the way. I don't know if you saw one of my previous posts, but I did get a mill. I got a Bridgeport mill. So that's a fun toy to play with. All right, I'll give you a look at these bearings once. They have a film on them from the get-go. So it's, it's a weird, almost dust kind of a film. So what we're gonna do, is we're going to spray a little WD-40 on a towel. I should have grabbed my white towels. This is a not the ideal towel. You want to use something that's more of a lint-free towel. 
This will work fine though for, for how I do it. And I'm going to go ahead and wipe off just a few swipes. And we'll compare the difference here if it focuses. Okay, so you can see how it's nice shiny on that side and this side has like that dust color look. Be sure to wipe that off. Um, it's always a good practice to get rid of that material. Now, the WD-40 is still on here and I want no oil on here for the measurement, so I'm gonna go to the dry side of the rag and give it a couple light swipes. I'm keeping my fingers off of the main surfaces to prevent contaminants from changing any kind of reading or, or acids in my oil, oils. Acids from the oil in my finger causing an issue. Uh, we have, this one is the upper bearing. So upper, of course you're gonna be holding this upside down. So this is technically the upper even though it looks like the lower, the position you're holding it. I've seen a lot of people make mistakes installing bearings and they've gotten away with it in some instances because they're running a stock crankshaft. If you have a stock crankshaft, they do not have a chamfer cut into the crankshaft for strength. It's uh, like a counter cut. And the reason that you want to make sure that you get these in right, they don't have any holes or anything, but this side here, you see there's a bunch of extra gap there, and this side, the bearing's pretty much right up against it. That's because the chamfer of the crank is going to go on this side. So the rod to piston location is important on an LS-based engine. Your valve reliefs, if you only have two, go towards the top of the block, and then that chamfer goes towards the front of the block, if you were to have it in that way, of course. And then once you go to the other side of the engine, it goes towards the back of the block. But if you just put all the pistons this way, you, you aim that chamfer towards the intake, you're going to be good. The LS-based engines, the heads can be interchanged from side, from left to right. They are the same exact part number. Everything's good. Leave a comment in the comment section. If you've ever installed uh, these spiral locks, God, do they suck. How much do you enjoy installing spiral locks? That is my question for you. I'm not gonna set that like that, that's risky. There we go. I'm gonna get the other bearing in here and I'm gonna move that cap off to the side so I don't risk dropping it while I'm putting the piston in. I didn't wait this guy off yet. Now when I'm doing this, because this is a is not a lint-free rag, and I just I do this naturally anyway, there's sharp edges on here. Sometimes I will take the time with a deburring tool, something like this, and I'll just kind of go around all the, the edges to get rid of the sharp edges. This one wasn't as bad as some of them are, so I kind of left it alone. But when you're wiping this thing, make sure you wipe like that. You don't want to dig into the sharp edge. You'll leave a bunch of towel behind on it. Normally, I would have my area a lot cleaner if I was building somebody else's engine, but being my own, I'm kind of like, eh, if something happens, I guess it's not the end of the world. What am I looking for? Oh, ring presser. I'm not in the groove of things anymore. I was in the groove when I was doing these last few, and then, of course, I took a break to wait for doing a live stream for you guys. I shouldn't have even put that... My bad. I wait. I'm, I'm prematurely putting these things in. Leave that guy out when you put the piston in. Trust me. It'll it'll fall out on you. Ring orientation also important. I was about to skip over that. I, for the sake of, in case they stay in position, they do tend to rotate. But just in case they stay in position. The exhaust valve here is where it's going to see a lot of fire during the exhaust stroke, of course, because all the all the fire, all the heat from here is going to be exiting out this exhaust valve. So I try to avoid putting the top ring on that side. And then, of course, I'll take the, the second ring and I'll go ahead and put it on that side because it really doesn't matter. It should be protected by the top ring. This may or may not last 
through the flight of the engine. A lot of times they will rotate. Sometimes they'll just keep rotating for a while. Other times they might just move a little bit and then that's it. But I put them there just in case they stay. It's nice to have them in the right position. Where'd the wrench go that I had? Now this is one of the cheaper, more um, budget-friendly ring compressors, I guess you could call it. It's kind of a, it's just a strap is all it is that you're, you're tightening down. They work. If you're going to do a lot of engines, which I should have it already, I don't know why I don't, um, get the style of ring compressor that fits the bore you're doing. So I should have a, a set of common ring compressors and basically all they are at that point is it's an aluminum sleeve with a coating on it and it's got a taper so you just set the piston on top of that sleeve and you slide it down in there and, you, and it just compresses the ring as you push it down in. They work amazing I guess but I don't have one so I have yet to use one. Gonna line that piston up. Make sure this ring compressor is all the way down. You don't want to get a ring caught if you can help it. There it is. So now I've got to flip this guy over. Where's my bolt at? There it is. I'm going to tip it towards you guys so you can actually see it a little bit. Actually, I'm going to bring the camera a little closer. There we go. Okay. Push this guy up carefully and slowly. If it hits anything, you gotta adjust a little bit. Not the end of the world. I'm gonna bring it up and guide it without smacking into the crankshaft. And I'm not gonna go all the way into it. That guy's bottom note. I'm not talking as much here, of course, because I don't want to screw things up. Uh, extension, there it is. Little tech tip, rather than fight the crankshaft, if you have any balancing holes, which this crank is balanced, you can use them for a leverage point to turn this guy over. I didn't have that in an ideal position. So the first test we're going to do is we're going to get this cap tightened down. You see I just kind of lightly walked it in there and then I'll use the torque wrench to bottom it out. Now I'm not going to tighten it yet because I want to show you guys a little something. So we're going to set this thing way down at 20 foot pounds. We're just going to do 20 for now. <clears throat> I gotta grab my dial indicator. This is a little trick I just kind of figured out. I've never been told this, but I figured this out on my own. 
you can kind of measure, you can measure, you can't kind of, you actually can measure the clearance with a dial indicator once the thing's on. Now, I did 20 foot pounds only. This is a 63 foot pound rod bolt because I want to show you guys a little rod stretch action while I'm doing this live here. What the heck is going on with this thing? Oh, there we go. Technical difficulties, dang it. Of course, I'll get you guys a better view of this dial indicator once I'm ready. It's going to take me a minute. This is definitely the hard part. Set, ah, especially if you turn it the wrong way. Setting this thing up. But I want to try and show you guys something. Okay. So I'm going to hold... I think I'm on there tight. Yeah, okay. I'm going to hold the, the connecting rod against the crank surface, and I'm going to push it back and forth this way. I think you guys can see the indicator there. Oh, maybe not. Let's see if we can get a better view of that indicator. I could possibly start the car up in the background. It's going to have to wait until the end of the stream, though, dang it. There we go. Now you can see that indicator. We're gonna go ahead and throw it on zero. So, well, we'll throw it on 10, we'll throw it on 20. We'll throw it on one of the numbers. I got the, that stupid little thing in the way of the zero there, so. All right, so I'm gonna go back and forth. Now, if you look at this, I have four, okay. Almost four thousandths clearance. I have three and a half thousandths of clearance on this rod bearing as it sits. Watch what happens when I tighten this guy down. It should tighten up considerably. Now we're going to go to 62. Not quite 63 yet. I'll do that in the final torque. I just want to see the difference in the rods. Okay, so now Oh, it didn't increase or decrease that much. That's unusual. This one might have a little too much clearance. I'm going to have to double check it. Oh, there we go. So now I have three instead of three and a half, which is not enough. Uh, let's go ahead and do a little plasti gauge on this one. This one does not seem like it's good, unless it's just the side clearance, which still, that's not good. Maybe it's out of round. Maybe I should have had the rods checked even though they're brand new. Of course the last one I do and the one I do live is the one that's going to have an issue. All the rest of them were fine. Wampus. There it goes. Oh, 
Jeez, you guys can't even see what I'm doing. There we go. So now we're going to show the plastic gauge method. And because of gravity, I'm actually going to put it off to the side. So, <clears throat> if this rod is stretched, we know there's three and a half thousandths on the side of the rod because I was measuring side clearance. But if the rod is stretched, which it shouldn't be, or oblong, it's brand new, there's no reason it should be, this measurement will be tighter than the measurement I just took. plastic gauge if I don't pull that rod up first. I feel like it might have bumped it. Dang it. I don't trust it. That's the problem with plastic gauge. Oh, okay, it's right here, so it's still okay. That is the problem with plastic gauge. So it can fall out really easy. Okay, now because the plastic gauge is in there, I don't want to vibrate it too much when it's actually tight. This should show a little wider reading because it is moving a little bit as I'm tightening and loosening things. But what it'll do is it'll be wider on the ends and narrow in the center. And that center is going to be the accurate portion of the plastic gauge measurement. Plastic gauge is a very sensitive item. If you stretch it or squish it or, or mangle it in any way, shape, or form, it is going to be inaccurate and not suit your purposes. Now, how am I going to get this off of here without causing more drama? I hate using plastic gauge for this reason. I'm gonna try something here. I've never done this before. Usually I do the same way to get it off, but I'm worried it'll affect the plastic gauge measurement. So I'm gonna try just propping up on this. It's not gonna let me, is it? Nope. Nope, I gotta do it the same way. I don't like doing it that way. I feel like I'm gonna squish the plastic gauge. If you guys know anything about a better way to do this, let me know because I've always struggled with this part of it. I'm going to try this. I really don't want to hit the side of the rod, but this is going to be inaccurate. I don't like it. Well, I do only have this part loose. So, this is the only side that's stuck on there. If I can get that off of there without moving anything, it might be alright. Boy, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Okay. We'll see what that does. Let's hope for the best. Okay. Looks like it did exactly as I was explaining. I don't think it got distorted by my thing necessarily, by my pounding on it. Maybe it did though. We can verify it by doing a measurement on the other side. I hate taking it apart so many times. Oh, wrong side. So we are one and a half thou there. It, it might have squished it by doing what I did. Son of a gun. I should have put it on the other side. I'm trying to do it so you guys can see it, but it's not gonna pan out for me. 
Put in my WD-40. Just making sure it's zoomed out. WD-40 to clean off that uh, plastic gauge. Works really good. Alright, do it the way I normally would. Put it on the bottom. I wanted you guys to see it though. So putting it on the bottom is a bit tricky, but it's going to be a lot more accurate. Um, which is hard to say with plastic gauge, but you know. It's the best I can provide right now because I'm not going to pull it back out. Where did I put my razor blade? Boy, I'm just losing everything. Typical live stream for me, is, I swear. There it is. A lot of extra trouble for just a single bearing that didn't measure the way I wanted it to, out of all eight of them. Okay. Oh, can I get that the right way? Engines and transmissions are very time consuming. All right, let's see what we got now for a reading. Now I feel a lot more comfortable tapping on this end of it because it's only going to push that plastic gauge away. All right, now I got a looser measure measurement, so that just proved the the point I made there that. Measuring it that way is no good. So now we have two thousandths, which is acceptable for me. I can live with that. So <clears throat> the problem is, does it have that side bearing issue like I was thinking? So now do I have to measure that separately? I don't know. Is it worth it? I don't know. It's not going to cause an issue. It's, it's a bit much though. If it is actually Four thousandths, that's a lot of clearance. I think I should probably do a side clearance plastic gauge for good measure. Now that we know that that's at two thousandths. So doing a side clearance on the plastic gauge is a little more tricky. <clears throat> and it's going to be expectedly... Oh, I just screwed up my plastic gauge. I set my torque wrench on it. No, I only hit some of it. So, let's go ahead and get this guy up against there. I'm going to set this guy. Well, this is going to be a challenge. Okay. Where there is no grinding. I'm gonna tighten it one more time. This this is getting too much for me. I don't like putting this much stretch stress on the bolts. 
I'm gonna go a little under again. I know I'm under already, but. Ah, come on. Definitely not part of the plan here. Okay, did I get any resemblance of a measurement? No, hell no. I was afraid of that. Ah. All right, we're gonna skip this part for now. I'm gonna go ahead and push this through. Unless you guys are okay with waiting, I'm gonna push this guy back out. I gotta measure it from outside the engine. Something ain't right here. I do not like this one. This is the joy of building your own motor, I guess. So I'm going to first do it without the bearings in. Because I want to check the rod for being out of round. I'm not going to bust out my bore gauge for this, but I am going to use a caliper and very carefully try and get a resemblance of a measurement here. See if I can notice a difference. If you're careful enough, you can measure fairly accurately with these things. So we got... The biggest I can get, not even changing, uh, two... Two, two, four. So we'll go 224 on the thousandths part. And then we'll go on the top and bottom side here. Two twenty-five. Wait. That don't add up. More clearance on the end. And go over here again. There's a fox in the hen house here somewhere. Oh, there we go. Now I got 226. I must have been measuring wrong. So this is out around. Out around. Well, son of a. Six. So. <clears throat> Boy, that puts things at a standby. That really sucks. Because I don't have the equipment to hone a rod out like that. So what has to happen now is this cap has to be, the cap where the seams are have to be cut and it has to be reset. Um, being a brand new rod, I might contact Eagle. These are Eagle rods and see if there isn't something they can do about it. Uh, I'm going to have to do some more measuring on this later. Bummer. So for now, we are going to hold off on putting that piston in. 
Boy, I hope I don't have to. I'm gonna have to though. <laughs> that means I have to deal with spiral locks again. Ugh, those things aggravate me. All right. Now that we know that scenario is screwed, what's my next step here? Besides put the bearings back in the box or somewhere safe. I suppose I can check fitments on my window trays. Oh, we gotta talk about oiling systems and oil pumps. I wanna talk about that on this stream, that's right. We'll go into that on this stream. So, LS-based engines, oiling systems, oil pumps, why not to replace an oil pump? Very, very rare do they ever fail. It's extremely rare. They're a very robust design. I'm trying to think, do I have one I can just zip apart quick? Uh, yeah, I don't want to zip one apart quick. But all you have to do to check your pump is there's a cover here. You, know, you pull, obviously you have the pump off. You pull this cover off. There's a set of intertwined gear units. I forget the style of gear, what the, what the name of it is. But basically, it's a very simple, simple pump design. And this is all the way up until 2014, whenever, whenever they implement the direct injection, they change the pump design to a vein pump. This pump, however, is a very, very robust pump. Pretty much never fails. If it fails, you have a lot more stuff to worry about because there's something catastrophic in your engine that sent a bunch of metal into this pump to cause it to fail. So this one had a bunch of sludge and debris going into the pump, and it's still, the pump looked beautiful on the inside so what does that tell you I mean 300,000 miles it looked amazing I need to say more I mean that's all I really need to say now how's this oiling system work on these engines so the sump sitting over here somewhere there we go right here obviously pulls the oil in from the pan goes into this inlet here and then it gets pushed through the pump around Oh, come on, motor, turn. Just slide the wheels then. So it gets pumped in and through, or it goes, actually, I think it goes this way, into here. There's a pressure relief valve here for pushing out excess oil that's exceeding the pressure. Now, the high volume systems in the newer uh, AFM engines, I think not really newer, but this is, this is older than those are. Um, the more common AFM engines that are still around, they have a secondary relief valve in the oil pan. I have one sitting over there, but we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, the oil pump feeds into here. There's a passage, there's a port right here. This port is drilled out through to this hole. And then this port goes all the way through the length of the block. So this oil has gone nowhere yet other than through this port. It comes down the line here, up to here. There is a dumbbell looking thing that comes from the back of the block into it and separates these two ports here. That way it goes through the filter, gets cleaned out, and then back into the engine. So these systems get filtered before oiling anything. It has its pluses, it has its minuses. It means, oh, excuse me, excuse me there. I'm very tired. Um, I need to aim this up a little bit, don't I? You guys can't see me at all. Okay, that's better. All right. It means that the chance of you actually ruining your bearings or getting contaminants in your lifters and wrecking your lifters, things like that, is very, very slim from debris. If something happens inside the motor, it pushes all that metal out and into the pan, and then the only thing that's going to have a chance of wrecking is the pump. So if your pump is in good shape, the rest of your motor is probably in decent shape as well. Except for, I need to sleep, except for whatever part has actually failed. Now, it comes in through the filter, and then it goes through this passage here, and then there's another port. Ugh, see if I can show you here. 
There's another port, there's a plug right here. This plug gets drilled all the way through and up to here. And this guy has two ports that come and inter intersect with that one. So there's a camshaft, I can't see it here. There's, there's two ports right here. There's a cam block off plate. I have one sitting up here. On the front and the rear of the engine, so you can see the, the similar shape there. This one sits here, and this one is at the back of the engine. Now this one is a cavity here, so it the, the port that comes up to this oil sensor, now on the AFM engines it's up a little higher, but the port that goes to this AF, this oil sensor here feeds the side, the oil galley that goes underneath the lifters on this side of the engine. The only way the other side of the engine gets oil is through the cam plate system. There's this side, so it goes through the front, and this side, and this is hollow here, so it goes through the back, and then oils the other side of the engine. Now your mains are oiled through those same main oil galleys. So you have Those two oil galleys underneath the lifters running this way, and there's a hole that's at the bottom of these main bearing caps, or not, not the caps, but the, the part of the block. Underneath the crank, there's a hole drilled through that goes all the way into that oil passage. Your cam has not been lubed yet. That hole that lubes the crankshaft also lubes the camshaft. There is a, it slightly cuts through where the cam bearings go into, and there's a hole in the cam bearing that has to line up with that slot that is drilled through. Now, if you're building performance engines, there is the LSX engine. It's a, it, it's an orange, it's iconically orange, the Chevy orange. And if you have that block, the one downside to that block that I noticed on the only one that I did was the, the holes that feed the oil to the crankshaft were way smaller than the rest of them. So I took the time and drilled them out, made them bigger like they're supposed to be. That way they could properly and adequately oil the rest of the engine. All right, now that I'm at a standstill with this particular project, let's go ahead and talk about some cylinder head action after I bag this guy up, before I wrap up the night. Do you guys want to hear a high horsepower Corvette startup because I have it running or have it capable of running. I just got started. Obviously it's not running now. You'd hear it loud and clear. If so, throw me a comment in the live section there and I'll go ahead and start that thing up as I finish off this video. But before we do, since I have the uh, 232, whatever those other heads are, the, the higher flowing heads, the newer Gen 4 heads here. I want to compare those to the Gen 3 heads while I'm live. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so this is the one that I was going to cut live if you guys voted for it, but you voted for doing the engine work. So we obviously, I cut it earlier today because I figured screw it. It's obviously not going to be that that we're doing. So this guy is the um, 862, and this one is the 243 head. So both of them have been machined. So we're gonna compare apples to apples here, except for the valves, this didn't have a valve job. But the combustion chambers are where the big difference is. Uh, I wonder if I can, there we go, it sits up there. Get you guys a closer view of what we're looking at. I see a couple have started, so we're gonna have to start it, I suppose. So I don't know how well you can tell it's on camera. This guy here, the combustion chamber, is a bit smaller on this one. This one has a bigger an intake valve. I believe the exhaust valve is a little bit bigger too, but the combustion chamber even extends out a little further that way. There is a little bit of a different burn design here. Not much, just, just real small changes, real subtle changes in this. But this one, uh, what's the factory? 68 cc, I think. This is 72. I don't recall. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. 
this is definitely a bigger chamber and that is the main difference here bigger chamber and a bigger intake valve so you have more flow but less compression that's why i'm going to use this on my particular engine to increase compression and decrease high end flow but increase low end flow so low speed flow is important for me right now and that's what i'm concentrating on this head also has slightly bigger intake chambers as well i believe i think it's only like 10 cc's more or something like that so better for top end performance i don't know why gm decided they wanted more top end performance on a motor that already suffers for torque but you know gm has their own decisions to make i guess All right, you guys are staring at a floor. Beautiful, beautiful floor right there. Not really. So we have a car in the hoist here. I got a few things in the way. But why don't we start this thing up, huh? What the heck, why not? You can use a little run time anyway. Supercharger noises or exhaust noises? Which one do you want? All right, I saw both. We're gonna we're gonna start it at the exhaust because why not? And then I'll quiet the exhaust down since this has a switch for that, and we'll go to the supercharger. This car is not even in gear. Let it run for a minute before I hit the throttle. Why don't we go ahead and hit a thumbs up, at least for the car, I suppose. Get a little throttle at the back, we'll open up the exhaust.
Wow, that's weird. It looks smoky on the camera, but it's not smoky at all in here. Interesting. And I suppose we'll end with the the mill in the picture here. Hopefully that video was all right. <laughs> so much for my uh, engine build process. We're gonna go ahead and probably do the differential a little bit later this week. Obviously this is gonna be put on hold for a little bit, unfortunately, there's not anything I can do about it. I am not putting that connecting rod in, it's too loose. Uh, that was the only one that was like that, like I said, so it is what it is. Um, I'm enjoying the new toy, I've been playing with it a little bit, trying to get, get to know it, get used to it. I did cut this head a little bit, but it's a rough finish, so I gotta do another cut on it. I'm kinda learning how to how to make the finishes right. The feeds and speeds I need for my bar that I made. This is a it's like a fly cutter, but I made it for I made it out of some stock aluminum I had sitting around just for doing cylinder heads. Because this machine is not intended for resurfacing things as big as a cylinder head. This is about as big as it can do. Uh, that's probably pushing it actually to be honest. I should be sticking to V6s, but I'm gonna use it for this because I can and I can get away with it So with that like share subscribe and as always I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching the live stream <laughs>